Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's workshop on the 2020 Safe Drinking Water Plan Public Workshop. The Safe Drinking Water Plan is a report which is provided. Oh, sorry. My screen's just shifted. Sorry about that. Uh, the Safe Drinking Water Plan is a report which is provided to the state legislature once every five years. Today's workshop will begin with a presentation by the drinking water staff summarizing the history of the Safe Drinking Water Plan, some updates since the 2015 Safe Drinking Water Plan, and an overview of the 2020 Safe Drinking Water Plan. Following the presentation and a short break, we're going to begin receiving your public comments. We ask that comments be kept to no more than three minutes in length to help ensure that everyone interested in commenting is able to do so. Please understand that today's public workshop is an opportunity for you, the public, to provide comments on the topic of the draft safe drinking water plan at a public workshop. If you don't wish to provide your comments orally, you may also submit written comments. Uh, if you haven't already done that, the instructions to do so are in the notice for this workshop. I also wanna let everyone know that this meeting is being webcasted and recorded, so please speak clearly. In order to comply with the public gathering limitations and physical distancing requirements at, and as authorized by the governor's executive orders to address the COVID-19 emergency, there is no physical meeting room. For people who only wanna listen or watch this meeting, staff has set up a webcast channel on the Water Board's public meeting live webcast page for a live webcasting of this workshop. If you missed today's workshop, a recording of the webcast will be available on our website. We'll be receiving public comments through a Zoom meeting platform for today's workshop. If you intend to present or comment or think you might be interested in commenting, you should already be in the Zoom meeting using the meeting ID provided in the board's website and the password that you received. If you haven't received a password, you can email ddwstaff at ddw-techops, that's T-E-C-H-O-P-S, at waterboards.ca.gov. Please include speaker comment in the subject line so our staff can follow up with you. For those in the Zoom meeting, you will be on mute and your camera will be turned off until it's your turn to speak. Our staff will then unmute you and ask you to turn on your camera if you have one. When you're done speaking, you'll be placed on mute and your camera will be turned off. You can choose to exit the Zoom meeting or stay in and watch the rest of the meeting on Zoom. Uh, you could also join us on the webcast. Thank you everyone. That should sum up the housekeeping for today and we're on to the presentation. All right, and then that would be me. So thank you for joining us today for this workshop on the Safe Drinking Water Plan. Now, if you thought you were logged into the Mesa College Algebra 101 Zoom class, well, you're on the wrong call. My name is Randy Barnard, and I'm the Chief of Division of Drinking Water's Technical Operations Section. The Safe Drinking Water Plan is a unique opportunity. As you'll hear, the impetus for the Safe Drinking Water Plan is established in the statutes by the state legislature. I say it's a unique, unique opportunity for a couple of reasons. First, the promise of the Safe Drinking Water Act has not been fully met in California. The vast majority of us are fortunate to have safe and reliable drinking water at all times provided by capable public water systems. Still, too many communities have serious ongoing drinking water quality problems, including violations of primary drinking water standards for many years. The problem is well documented and the action is underway to correct it, but what else can we do, collectively speaking, to, to meet the promise of the Safe Drinking Water Act? That's where this plan comes in. The second reason why I say that this is a unique opportunity is that the legislature has directed us in statute to provide a set of recommendations to improve drinking water quality. These include uh, recommending legislative actions, program actions by the state board, and actions by the public water systems themselves. Now, this is the third version of the Safe Drinking Water Plan. There was the original 1993 version, a 2015 version, and now this 2020 version. We are right now in the public comment period for the current plan. Next slide, please. The purpose of this workshop is to provide background on our current plan, review what we've done since the last plan, give you an overview of this new plan, and invite you to comment on what we're recommending. You can do this in writing by sending us an email, or if you just want to say your comment, you can do that at the end of our presentation. Now, 
If you're not already done so, like was mentioned in the beginning, and you'd like to make a verbal public comment, you're going to need to be signed into the Zoom meeting. So just request the password following the instructions included on the notice to this public workshop. And we'll also be showing a link to that later on if you need that. Next slide, please. With me here today, I have two of our staff who have been leading the development of this plan, Mark Bartson and Ashley Doomer. Mark was involved with the preparations of the previous versions of the plan, both in the early 1990s and in 2015. And he is, was the lead in the early discussions and drafting of this current plan. Ashley has led finalizing the plan and will do the review of all the public comments. She'll also be preparing the staff report to the State Water Board later this summer. Next slide, please. So what we're gonna to talk to you about today is an introduction, which I just did. I'll, I'll next go over the schedule and then Mark will walk you through some history. Ashley will then explain the new draft plan to you. After that, I'm sure we'll all be ready for a quick break and then we'll come back and hear some comments and answer any questions. Next slide. So here's our current schedule. The key milestones are this, public comment closes on April 23rd. We'll be considering all comments received as we finalize the plan. And we'll provide those to the state water board members. We have a target date of August 3rd for a presentation to the state water board in one of their board meetings. And then in August, we plan to submit the final report to legislature. Next slide, please. So what's the purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Plan? Well, broadly speaking, it assesses California's drinking water quality, and it looks at specific problems and health risks to the public. And most importantly, it gives us an opportunity to make our best case for specific recommendations to improve drinking water quality. Next slide, please. Now, more specifically, the purpose of the plan can be summed up by the following quotes that I've taken out of the plan itself. And those go, since the establishment of the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act in 1974, there have been major improvements to the quality of drinking water for the vast majority of communities served by public water systems. However, for many communities, the promise of safe drinking water has not been met. And in many cases, safe drinking water has not been available for multiple years. This report provides a timely and unique opportunity to chart the overall course towards providing safe drinking water for all communities in California. And now with that, I'd like to hand this over to Mark who will walk you through some history. Thank you, Randy, for that nice introduction. I appreciate it. My name is Mark Bartson. I have been involved with the early stages of the development of this plan until about a year ago when Ashley stepped in and took over moving this plan through the process and towards finalization. I'm happy to be involved at this point. First, I want to give you a little bit of the history of the safe drinking water plan since I was around for both the first, the second, and now the third version of the plan. In 1993, I was fortunate enough to be working in our district office on implementing the drinking water regulatory program. So I had a role in implementing many of the recommendations. <clears throat> in 2015, I was involved with the preparation and implementation of the plan. In 2019, Assembly Bill 2501 added a couple of additional, additional topics to the plan that we will talk about in some detail in a few minutes. <clears throat> and here in 2021, we have the release of the draft plan for public comment, where we are today, of course. In 2025 is the scheduled next version of the plan. So that's not too far down the road. In each of the plans, we have an implementation plan that we'll be talking about in some detail today. Next slide, please. I want to give you an overview of the plan contents pursuant to statute. As Randy mentioned, this is a statutorily mandated plan and it includes 12 specific topics specified in statute. This version covers two new topics put in statute in 2019, the topics of administrators and consolidations in achieving safe drinking water for communities. More detail on that in a few minutes. The plan includes recommendations for action by the legislature, the state water board and public water systems. 
and it addresses public water systems serving fewer than 10,000 service connections. Next slide. So what are public water systems? A little bit of context here on the drinking water world are the public water systems and all the other sources of supply that people have where they get water. So the public water systems fit into three categories. There's community water systems, which serve residential areas such as cities, town and mobile home, home parks, where we live, where people live. The non-transient, non-community water systems, which serve the same people daily, at least six months per year, such as schools and businesses where 25 or more employees are there day after day and so have a high level of exposure. And then the transient non-community water system which serve a transient varying population in non-residential settings for at least 60 days per year, 25 or more people. This includes restaurants and campgrounds, roadside rest stops with their own water supply that we all visit at one time or another. Next slide. Now the universe of public water systems, and these are statistics from the report, fairly large. We have a total of 7,369. Community water systems, just a little bit less than 3,000. The non-transient, non-community, again, the schools, the businesses with their own water supply, about 1,500. And the transient, non-community, about 3,000. So it's a large universe. Next slide. <clears throat> So as far as the contents of the plan, there's the 12 elements that I had mentioned, I'll go through those here. It's to include an overall, an analysis of overall quality of California's drinking water and specific water quality problems, types and level of contaminants and estimated costs to meet primary standards and public health goals, a discussion of the known and potential health risks, an evaluation of how to improve existing water quality information systems to be more effectively used to protect drinking water. And you'll see in the current plan that this fourth element is a really important one to it, an entire chapter dedicated to that. Data and information is key to so many aspects of this. The fifth element is an evaluation of the research, research for screening and detection of waterborne chemicals. What more can we do there? The sixth element is an analysis of the techni technical and economic viability and the health benefits of various tre treatment techniques innovative techniques, long-standing techniques for treatment. How are they working? Next slide. The seventh element of the plan is alternatives for financing construction, installation, and operation of new treatment technologies. Again, the focus on treatment. Eight is sources of revenue available to public water systems to meet current and future expenses. Nine is the current cost of drinking water by residential, business, and industrial consumers. 10 is recommendations to improve the quality of drinking water with a five-year implementation plan. 11 and 12, the two new topics are the review of the use of administrators to achieve access to safe drinking water and the review of consolidations used to achieve access to safe drinking water. How have those new program elements been going? Both of those are relatively new program elements. They're works in progress. Next slide. <clears throat> A little bit more about these two new plan elements, consolidations and administrators, since they're so foundational to the work we're carrying out under our safe and affordable, um, the safe under the safer program and to our program as a whole. Simply stated, consolidations in particular and administrators are very important tools for small communities to be able to meet sustainably safe drinking water standards. There's a link to the, uh, our page on consolidation and partnership of the website we have set up for that on this page. And a couple more words about these elements as spelled out in statute. What we are to cover in this plan and in more in future plans is a look at the number of communities that have achieved access to safe creek of water through consolidation or through the use of an administrator. How has this impacted the rate structure of affordability? How has this played out in the rate structure? How have the costs and duties of the administrator played out in a comparison of the cost both before and after. And most importantly, whether the administrator program should be modified to better serve communities. Also, are there barriers to consolidation that we need to work on? You'll see quite a bit in the report on that. And whether the consolidation program should be modified. 
So the legislature wants a fairly deep dive into these topics since they're so foundational to success going forward. Next slide. <clears throat> Wanted to touch on some of the information and consolidations beyond what's in our report to keep track of current developments, ongoing statistics, and how it's going and during implementation. On our website, we have these 10 different topics that cover both administrator and consolidation with tools, step-by-step, -step, and basically statistics on consolidation on how it's going. Also information on water partnerships and consolidation events, where are they taking place? And information under number 10 there on the mandatory consolidation program for disadvantaged communities pursuant to statute. Next slide. And just finally on the administrators, again, pursuant to the health and safety code, the, the um, statute that's been in effect for about a year and a half now, or actually since September 2018, the state water board has new authority to order the appointment of an administrator to a public water system after it makes findings and under specified circumstances that are required and completes the required public notification process. <clears throat> Next slide. Well, there's certainly been a lot that's gone on since the 2015 Safe Drinking Water Plan. And I want to recap just a few of the milestones that have been reached, milestones and kind of key events, things that uh, new elements of the program that are in place. In 2016, the Human Right to Water Resolution was adopted by the State Water Board, following up on the 2012 adoption of a statute identifying the human right to water in state statute. In 2017, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act reached a major milestone for medium and high priority groundwater sustainability agencies formation. 2017, adoption of the maximum contaminant level for 123 TCP, and on down through this list. I'll call your attention to a couple of these elements um, that I want to talk about in more detail. Next slide. I want to talk about in particular the establishment of the SAFER program pursuant to SB 200 discussed in some detail in our report and certainly foundational to all of our work now. <clears throat> Basically, this, the, safe, the Safe and Affordable Funding for Equity and Resolution Program, SAFER, is a set of tools, funding sources, and regulatory authorities designed to meet the goals of safe drinking water, safe, accessible, and affordable drinking water for all Californians. I also call your attention to the release of the Water Resilience Portfolio in July of 2020. Next slide. And again, a summary of the SAFER program, purpose, safe drinking water in every California community for every Californian. The first few steps include the adoption of the initial SAFER funding expenditure plan and policy, the identification of at-risk public water system, that's a new tool we're developing, state small systems and domestic wells. So state small systems and domestic wells do not meet the defi definition of a public water system. That there are ways that people get water, whether they have individual wells or a small group of two or four or five or less than 15 wells, uh, homes on one well. So that's a big part. Well, a lot of people are served by those type of sources that are outside public water system realm, but are considered and are under the broader umbrella of SAFER. And again, there's a website for the SAFER Drinking Water Program for current information. Next slide. So a little bit more on the water resilience portfolio. This was ordered by executive order in April 2019, not too long after Governor Newsom took office. In his statement accompanying this executive order, he stated that to meet the water challenges, we need to harness the best in science, engineering, and innovation to prepare, prepare for what's ahead and enhance long-term water resilience and ecosystem health. We'll need an all of the above approach to get there. Next slide. Some of the, ident some of the challenges identified by Governor Newsom as we headed into the development of this portfolio were unsafe drinking water at the very top of the list major flood risks, severely depleted, depleted groundwater aquifers, uncertain water supplies, native fish populations threatened with extinction. All these are part of the greater water landscape. Next slide. 
In July of 2020, just a little less than a year ago, the water resilience portfolio was adopted. To develop the portfolio, state agencies, all state agencies that are involved in water issues, conducted an inventory and assessment of California's water, solicited broad input from tribes, agencies, individuals, groups, and leaders across the state. An interagency working group considered the assessment and input from more than 20 public listing sessions across the state and more than 100 comment letters. The priorities identified in the portfolio include, again, at the top of the list, implementing the Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Act, supporting local communities to successfully implement the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act of 2014, and a host of other recommendations and priorities for action to be taken by state agencies. This work is underway. It's woven into everything we collectively do. Next slide. What I'm going to cover now is taking a look back at the 2015 plan and some of the recommendations we had, and a little bit of reporting out on some of the highlights um, from the 2015 plan. How did it go? The 2015 plan was divided into uh, these thematic elements, drought, affordable, safe drinking water, shared solutions, capacity development, program funding, program actions, transparency and information management again, treatment and analytical methods, and finally, emergency preparedness and response. You'll see these themes, many of them, of course, in the current plan. Progress has been made. The current plan reports out on a number of these. I'll cover a few highlights with the next few slides. Next slide. First, the recommendation from the 2015 plan regarding affordable, safe drinking water for disadvantaged communities. The recommendation at the time was that funding should be provided for infrastructure improvements to public water systems, particularly small systems serving disadvantaged communities that are not meeting safe drinking water quality requirements. And specifically, sufficient funding for administration should be included. The current status on this is clearly a work in progress. <clears throat> Very happy to report that we have the Safe Group Program in place to carry out much of this work. <clears throat> and that the legislature and the governor has really um, stepped, both stepped up on this program and have, have the Safer Program in place. <clears throat> Progress and associated reporting will continue on this element under the SAFER program. Next slide. <clears throat> Another recommendation from the 2015 report was shared solutions. Specifically, that refers to consolidations, regionalizations, partnerships. The State Water Board will continue to promote consolidation of state small, small water systems wherever feasible and appropriate. Consolidation is not limited to full or physical consolidation of drinking water treatments and delivery systems. It may include technical, managerial, financial, or physical arrangements between water systems. How is that gone? Well, a lot of progress, but a lot of work ahead. <clears throat> this continues to be a major priority with, with the overall drinking water program and the SAFER program. Consolidation is fundamental to more sustainable solutions for water systems. Next slide. We had a number of recommendations in the 2015 report related to treatment and analytical methods. The State Water Board specifically recommended enactment of legislation to allow expanded use of point of use and point of entry treatment by public water systems. Status of this is legislation was passed and the regulations are in place to allow point of use and point of entry on a limited basis for systems serving 200 service connections to achieve compliance with certain primary drinking water standards. It's an important tool in our toolbox. Next slide. <clears throat> Emergency preparedness and response. As part of the sanitary survey, the State Water Board will encourage all public water systems to update their emergency response plan at least every five years. This recommendation is discussed in the current plan. There's been some progress, but there's work ahead. Essentially what we talk about in the current plan is a discussion of whether this should be a mandatory element for all public water systems. Next slide. And finally, a recommendation on infrastructure condition. The State Water Board will continue to encourage community water systems to adopt an asset management project plan for infrastructure replacement as part of the rate setting process. Knowing the condition of the infrastructure and having a plan and schedule in place for eventual replacement. Some progress has been made on this, but again, this is 
being approached on a voluntary base. And the question discussed again in the plan is whether every public water system, certainly every community system, water system should have an infrastructure, an, an asset management plan to manage their infrastructure. Next slide. <clears throat> so in the 2020 plan, we, we asked the question, given that we're looking for recommendations for action, what can our water future look like? Well, it's up to all of us. <clears throat> what the water resilience portfolio has at the top of the list is that all Californians would have safe, have access to safe and clean drinking water. That certainly is the goal, should be the goal for all of us. With that, I'll pass the plan, I'll pass the, the baton over to Ashley for a discussion of the 2020 Safe Drinking Water Plan. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. As Randy mentioned early, I, I'm responsible for getting this plan completed, but unlike Mark, this is my first safe drinking water plan that I've had the opportunity to be involved with. Today, I will be covering what's in the 2020 safe drinking water plan. I will provide a brief overview of each of the 12 chapters, assuming that you have not had a chance to read the entire 225 page document. Then I'll discuss some of our draft recommendations and the major themes that were identified in the 2020 Safe Drinking Water Plan. I will then wrap it up by reminding you how to provide public comments on the plan. To begin, I have a sneak preview of four strong themes that really emerged from our work. We use these themes to organize our recommendations. Those four themes are emergency preparedness, sustainability, equity and the human right to water, and program actions. Now these themes definitely have some overlap with each other. And central to these themes is the reality that safe, clean, and affordable drinking water is essential for healthy communities. Collectively, we work hard to make this a reality, but we recognize we have more work ahead of us. So chapter one starts off the plan, and this is our introduction to the plan. It provides background information and describes the purpose of the Safe Drinking Water Plan. It also highlights some of the major legislative changes that have been made since the previous 2015 Safe Drinking Water Plan. And chapter one is intended to frame the issues and provide overall perspective. As an introduction, it does not contain any recommendations in it. Chapter two, we provide insight into the roles, responsibilities, and resources of various agencies and parties involved. We also discuss new ability in regards to consolidation and appointing administrators, which are new tools available to the Division of Drinking Water. We discuss various organizational structures of public water system, including ownership type, such as public agencies, private ownership, and mutual water companies. We have also included examples of the various types. This chapter provides background on the Division of Drinking regulatory program that's carried out by the Division of Drinking Water. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, the primary responsibility for compliance belongs to each public water system under their authority in their drinking water supply permit. It is important that we acknowledge the effort of public water systems in meeting this responsibility. It is because of this effort that most of us have access to safe drinking water that consistently meets all the standards. The question is, how do we close the remaining gap for communities that don't currently have safe drinking water? And chapter three discusses the various sources of supply. You may be aware that California depends on a combination of water sources to meet our needs. These sources don't just include groundwater and surface water, but in chapter three, we also discuss alternative water supplies such as ocean water desalination, and recycled water. These various sources are at risk from differing threats. We go into detail about the possible threats and some of the examples of these threats include 
well-known threat of nitrate in agricultural areas from fertilization application, and the emergency threat of PFAS compounds, which are currently under investigation statewide. But this chapter contains a number of recommendations as we realize how important protecting the quality of drinking water is. Chapter four talks about the systems that aren't currently meeting standards. While 98% of customers served by public water systems receive water that does meet standards, there are systems that violate these. In chapter four, we detail the violations that occurred between 2015 and 2019. We assess geographically where the violations were occurring and we evaluate the impact of the public water system size in their ability to comply with our various drinking water standards. Much of the discussion comes from annual compliance reports that are prepared by the State Water Board each year. And chapter five really dives into the data systems that the Division of Drinking Water staff are currently using. It all so introduces new data collection systems that are being worked on. And it addresses specific gaps in our current data, such as not having detailed information on state small water systems or domestic wells. This chapter also details our efforts to make our data available to others, providing greater transparency. Strong data systems are central to carrying out the mandates of the Safe Drinking Water Act. Timely, accurate, and complete information is needed by public water systems, regulatory agencies, and the public for various purposes. We are working on a number of ways to improve our data systems. Therefore, it's not a surprise that we have a ton of recommendations in this area. Chapter six explains the various analytical methods used to evaluate the quality of our water samples. This chapter does provide all of the federal and state standards. So if you ever wanted to know the difference between EPA regulations and the state water board, you could easily reference this chapter to compare the two. This chapter also talks about unregulated chemical monitoring that is performed and examines the improvements needed to our existing methods. It also evaluates new methods that are needed to better inform customers of their water quality. This information is important to help us in understanding if we need to lower our maximum contaminant levels and our ability to detect new chemicals such as microplastics. In previous chapters, we discussed contaminants that water systems may have. And in chapter seven, we discuss the various treatment technologies used to remove these contaminants. We also discuss the cost of compliance with 123 TCP at it was the only maximum contaminant level that was added since the 2015 Safe Drinking Water Plan. The chapter eight is our new brand exciting plan, and it's really made possible by the addition of our new safer unit. In this chapter covers possible reasons why water systems are failing, looks at possible indicators of systems that are likely to fail the standards, and what can be done when a water system does fail these standards. Much of this discussion is based on the work of our SAFER unit and has been done in the last year or so. A huge component of sustainability of public water systems is their ability to have adequate technical, managerial, and financial capacity. This chapter highlights the need for water partnerships and discusses some of our early lessons learned with our new tools for consolidation and appointing administrators. I really encourage you to read this chapter as it details so many aspects of our new program. And the SAFER unit has really just begun their work. So there's quite a few recommendations in this chapter as well. Chapter nine gets into costs and affordability. 
There are quite a few different things that can impact a water system's cost. One example is the type of source a water system utilizes. This can have a huge impact on the cost. This chapter also details water system sources of revenues and different impacts to those revenues. And it talks about the increased focus on the issue of affordability. Consistent with the human right to water and recent legislative authorities, such as Assembly Bill 401, the SAFER program, the State Water Board continues to focus on affordability. The AB 401 report evaluated water rates and affordability for customers of public water systems to assure access to safe drinking water. In addition, the SAFER program has developed additional methodologies and approaches to evaluate and consider affordability in the development of sustainable solutions. Chapter 10 details various funding programs available. Detailing all of the state water board funding programs that are available to the drinking water system. It also discusses different financing methods available. Water systems need funds for capital improvements. New or upgraded facilities may be necessary to meet regulatory requirements. In addition, aging infrastructure beyond its useful life must be replaced. In addition to upfront capital costs, water systems need to consider ongoing operations and maintenance costs. This is really critical for a system to be successful in the long run. For example, a water system may secure the funds necessary to install a water treatment facility. However, without the funds to cover the operation and maintenance of that facility, it's unlikely that they'll be able to continue to provide safe drinking water. Chapter 11 discusses the various threats to drinking water systems and some of the lessons we've learned by dealing with some emergencies and disasters over the last several years. This chapter covers fires, flooding, those kinds of threats. And specifically, one thing that was learned when I was working on this chapter was over 4 million acres of California burned in just last year. We know that these threats are inevitable to public water systems. Therefore, it's really important to evaluate previous response and determine how to prepare for when the next emergency occurs. This chapter has a good amount of recommendations as we have a lot of work to do in this area. Chapter 12 summarizes all the various recommendations from the different chapters. In total, we have 66 recommendations. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there are four themes that emerged as we developed the plan and these recommendations, and we organized the recommendations around these four themes. So please take a look at this graph. At the center, there's healthy communities, and that's really what our goal is. There are, are, of course, other components to healthy communities, but access to safe and affordable drinking water is necessary. The four main themes are emergency preparedness, sustainability, equity, and the human right to water, and program action. We worked with our graphics group to put this graphic together. We like that the pieces of the circle blend together as this conveys that the themes are interconnected. In fact, many of the recommendations are relevant to more than one of our themes. For example, a public water system without technical, managerial, and financial capacity is not likely to be able to meet all statutory and regulatory requirements across a range of operating conditions. They're less likely to be able to return to compliance after a violation and are less likely to be prepared to deal with and recover from an emergency when one happens. And this requires program actions. 
and I'll go through each of the four themes and pull out one recommend, at least one recommendation from each. So we're going to start with emergency preparedness. And under this theme, we discuss most common emergencies that we have experience with, such as wildfire, droughts, earthquakes, and flooding. Large emergencies and disasters over the last several years really brings this thematic area to the forefront. Unfortunately, with climate change, impacts to water systems and emergency events are more likely to occur. Therefore, it's really important to increase the overall level of preparedness and resiliency. So our first emergency preparedness recommendation is that all community water systems should be required to participate via membership in a mutual aid organization with other water utilities. It's really critical that water systems participate in mutual aid so that when an emergency does take place, the water system can more quickly address the issue. Another recommendation is developing a focused program to ensure California water systems are planning and preparing for the impacts of climate change. As we know, California drinking water systems are at risk from various threats. It is important to prepare for such events. This is even more critical with the impacts of climate change. And we have some specific examples of what systems can do to prepare for these emergencies. So moving on to our second theme on sustainability. For public water systems, the term sustainability refers to the ability to have technical, managerial, and financial capacity. Chapter eight really explores this topic in detail and key elements, including increased emphasis on opportunities for consolidation, developing asset management plans, and ensuring sufficient revenues will help in this area of sustainability. So our first recommendation for sustainability is the state water board will continue to encourage vulnerable water systems, particularly those that rely on a single groundwater source to study and improve their reliability. Water systems with a single source are at risk. We have seen this time and time again from recent public safety power shutoffs to equipment failure or impacts of drought. When a water system has only one source, they are at much higher risk of not being able to continuously provide safe drinking water. These systems should look for alternative sources to help alleviate their risk. Another sustainability recommendation would require accessible and publicly available information regarding technical, managerial, and financial status of all public water systems regardless of their governance types. As discussed in chapter eight, technical, managerial, and financial capacity of water system is an important factor in whether a water system can meet requirements. Having this information available to the public will increase our transparency and provide valuable information to the customers of these water systems. So moving along to equity and the human right to water. A lot of this theme really focuses on a bunch of the work that's been underway with the human right to water and our new SAFER program, which is targeting disadvantaged communities with ongoing violations and problems. Some of this also focuses on our increased reporting and transparency that provides foundation for this thematic area. And a big component of this is also the issue of affordability. Our first equity and human right to water recommendation is for that water systems who are interested in consolidating, they should be able to go through the process as quickly as possible. It's 
really important for systems that do want to consolidate that the process is as smooth as possible. That way, customers are able to be provided with safe, clean, and affordable drinking water all the sooner. Many small water systems have rates that are too low, and some still have flat rates. In order for water systems to maintain the rates needed to be able to cover water system expenses, they need to study their rates. Too often, we see water systems deferring needed system improvements to avoid the upfront costs, but end up having more costly repairs down the road. It's important that systems understand their expenses and evaluate their rate structures to be able to cover their expenses. Now moving on to our fourth major theme, program action. And this theme really refers to the State Water Board's collaboration in concert with public water systems, stakeholders, interested parties, and the public to identify desirable outcomes and achieve common goals. These recommendations are founded on an overall collaborative approach to meet the promise of safe drinking water for all communities. The State Board will continue to coordinate with local county and health or city planning departments, LAVCO, and local environmental health jurisdictions. This recommendation really highlights the need to coordinate with various agencies when evaluating if new water systems should be permitted. Improved coordination and information sharing will improve outcomes and reduce the formation of non-viable public water systems in the future. In the last several slides, I've given you a few highlights from chapters 12 on implementation. I ask for your review and thoughts on our draft recommendations among all the chapters. And so moving forward, finish talking about the 2020 Safe Drinking Water Plan, but I do want to remind you that we're currently doing our public workshops and the close of public comment will be April 23rd. And I really encourage you to take advantage of this unique opportunity and provide us feedback on the Safe Drinking Water Plan. So if you are interested in following the progress of the Safe Drinking Water Plan, you can visit the State Water Board's website on the Safe Drinking Water Plan page. And for those of you who are interested in providing written comment, I have included the four methods of how to go about submitting your comments. And again, I encourage you to sign into the Zoom meeting if you have not already done so. You can register for the Zoom meeting at the website on this slide, which will provide you the password to sign in to attend. You can also contact the Division of Drinking Water text op email. And with that, we will take a break and do it for, I don't know, 11 minutes and come back at 2.30. And we can go over questions and comments and anything else that you guys would like to discuss.
Hello everyone, it's 2.30 and we're back. It turns out that we don't have any commenters today, so we're going to go ahead and close out this meeting. Uh, remember that if you can still submit written comments, uh, even if you chose not to submit an oral comment, those, uh, the information for that is on the notice for this, uh, this meeting, and those can be submitted up through April 23rd at noon. Thank you everyone for joining us today, and we'll see you at a future, future meeting. <laughs> Have a good day.